reading chapter 7, Close to Cologne, by John Marshall Grant. This is a book called A Lot to Remember. Uh, it was published in 1962, and it's largely a travel account through a particular part of France, which she loved. She dedicated this book to uh, Dennis and Charles with love for A Lot to Remember. She has a lot of visions during these journeys and travels. Um, Joan passed away in 1989. Uh, this is also a historical, uh, lots of historical facts uh, she brings through. Chapter 7, Close to Cologne. Before moving south into the lot, I will mention some of the places which, although outside the departmental boundary, are only about an hour's drive from Cologne and begin with the most memorable, the Grotte de la Sceaux. Dennis and I had spent, had spent most of the morning shopping in Brie, when we decided that instead of going home to lunch, we would prefer to spend the afternoon looking at prehis prehistoric cave paintings. So we left the town by the N89 and 11 kilometers later arrived at Le Glissain Le Glissain in Lachey. It was an excellent lunch with the Vézère showing past the dining terrace and the bill was only 23 shillings. So I asked Madame Le, 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 La Patronne to show me the bedrooms, which were further evidence that it would be a delightful place at which to stay, especially as the full pension is only a guinea. I had gossiped with her longer than I realized, so I was afraid that when we got to Lascaux, we should be too late to be included in the 350 people which, on my two previous visits, had been the quota allowed each day to enter the cave. Because human breath was proving so much more destructive to the paintings than had the passing of 25 millennia, my anxiety proved groundless, for air, air conditioning has, been removed, has removed this hazard and no longer do coachloads of tourists arrive only to find that 10 o'clock in the morning is already too late in the day. Had I known this when we left Le Glucines, we would have taken the D60 to and then by a by road through Chazelle and Colley, so as to, to so as to see the fortified abbey, the a fortified abbey church of Saint Armand de Colly on our way. But instead we continued what is this? I don't know. <laughs> but instead we continued. Um along the N89 and then turned south on the N704 to follow the Vézère to Montinac, a charming little town, although crowded with tourists, to Lesco in the holiday season. Prosperity came to Montignac, Montignac through two trivial incidents. Uh, a tree was uprooted by a gale and a dog disobeyed its master's whistle. The tree tore a hole in the roof of a cave, but no one paid any attention to the hole, attention to the hole except to cover it with branches to prevent cattle falling in, for there are more unexplored caves in this limestone country than there are bubbles in a litre of Perrier water. Then, in September 1940, a dog scrambled down the slope of fallen earth into the hole, and when it failed to reappear, four boys went down to search for it, taking resinous pine knots with them to use as torches. Two of these boys are now guides to the caves and vividly convey the awed astonishment they felt when they first saw the treasure they had discovered, and the fear they felt also, for the animals seemed, the animals seemed to be moving in the flickering torchlight 
as they still seem to move, so instinct with life are they, even when one sees them illuminated by electricity. One should go with humility to a less school, for anyone who expects to see paintings which, although interesting, because of their extreme antiquity, are comparable only to those which might be expected from a talented child will receive a salutary readjustment of the historical perspective. And he would have to be remarkably obtuse not to notice that the men who created these agile deer, these gay little ponies, this surge of mighty bulls, were not primitives to be patronized, but artists whose visionary insight was allied to the highest technical skill. It was only half past four when we left La School, so instead of turning right on the A89 for Brive, we turned left until the N704 took us northwards to Hautfort. This castle, with its massive dome towers and its double drawbridge across the inner moat, stands on a white apron of formal gardens and dominates the surrounding landscape. It was altered and enlarged during the Renaissance, but the older part dates back another 400 years, for it was originally owned by Bertrand de Bourne, knight and troubadour of the court of Aquitaine. After a temporary reverse in the arts of love when Queen Eleanor's daughter Helen, to whom he addressed the most famous of his love songs, was given in marriage to the Emperor Otto. He devoted his energies to the arts of war by inciting Eleanor's eldest son to rebel against his father, Henry II. This was a remarkably foolish act, for the prince had recently been formally associated with the English throne and allowed to use the title of the Young King, although still popularly referred to by his nickname Henry Courtmantle. And even more important, he had just married the daughter and heiress of Louis VII, and so had every reason to look forward to inheriting the throne of both France and England. That he would never have done so, because Louis in his old age at last begot a son, Philip, by his third marriage, was a factor which Eleanor's 15 years of marriage to Louis gave her no reason to anticipate. No reason to anticipate. Some historians suggest that Eleanor and not Bertrand de Bourne was the real instigator of the rebellion, but I feel sure it would have curbed her son's impatience until he had seared an heir, and most certainly she would never have permitted an act of such crass stupidity as the hot-headed young man men committed when either to replenish their war chest with church treasure or as a gesture of defiance against not only paternal, but papal authority, they pillaged the shrine of Rock Amadour. The retribution for this sacrilege was immediate and ruthless. A priest of Rue Amadour cursed the court mantle so effectively that he could retreat only to Martel, a distance of 15 miles before he died, as a contemporary account records lying on a bed of ashes with a great crucifix heavy on his chest in terror of certain damnation. Either Bertrand's capacity for human affection protected him from a similar medication, or else no black arrow was flighted in his direction, for all he personally suffered was grief for the death of his companion. But in fear of the royal tage, right, rage, he withdrew to Huntford, Hutford, where the king besieged him. Being far too experienced a soldier to prolong, prolong a siege, when this could do so, when this could do no more than further exasperate the, the besieger, Bertrand surrendered, and as he expected, was condemned to death. Bernard the warrior was within an hour of his execution when he was saved by the poetry of Bertrand the Troubadour. He claimed a boon that Henry should allow him to sing the laments he had composed on the death of the young man they both so clearly loved. The boon was granted and the king was so moved by the song 
if you pardon the singer. As Dennis and I drove eastward from Hortford, I looked back to see it dark against a sky of a funerary purple, a somber mantling that might have been chosen for the play by Dante. For Dante, who could adore this Beatrice only if he did not have to test his capacity for loving in the crucible of living with her, set Bertrand in the ninth pit of the eighth circle of his inferno, carrying his severed head in his hand, lifting it by the hair as though it were a lantern, and sorrowful declaiming, Since you seek news of me, know that I am Bertrand de Bourne, he who gave ill counsel to the young king and made father and son rebel, the one against the other. This was hard, harsh judgment on a fellow poet, especially as Dante was usually mindful of the debt he owed to his forerunners, the troubadours, and Bertrand became a monk before he died, so presumably received priestly as well as royal pardon. Or did, Dan or did Dante disbelieve in the sincerity of Bertrand's conversion? having identified him as the unfortunate whom six ladies of the courts of love emasculated after packing his loins and ice so that he could not cheat them of their justice by bleeding to death. A manoeuvre which anticipated by 800 years the modern surgical technique of hypothermia. This stark punishment was supposed to have been inflicted on a gallant who boasted of his amatory success a version which no doubt proved a salutary warning, but it seemed far more likely that it was decreed by Eleanor when her innate chivalry was temporarily obscured by the anguish of bereaved maternity. Each of the roads that cross the ridge to the northeast of Colons has its individual merits. For instance, the D4 team from Mayasak from Mesak will eventually reach Ausbazin, a, a, a hill village above the valley of the Corriers, where there is a fine abbey, a fine abbey church. But the D150, or alternatively, alternatively the D10 and D15, also leads there, though surprising, through surprisingly different scenery. Often a side turning from a lush valley winds up through richly variegated woods to reach abruptly a treeless upland of heather and broom and rocky outcrop. And to the east of the N40, one of the two great trunk roads which bisect the lot from north to south, D161 on its way to Argonat Argentat, traverses an austere woodland, pine instead of walnut, bog cotton instead of orchard, Yet other contrasts are to return from Argentat along the right bank of the Dordogne by the water's edge, or to keep south of the river and by D33 and D41 follow the complex crests of forested ridges before the steep road winds down to Beaulieu du Dordogne. Dennis and I went to Beaulieu several times for it is only about half an hour from Colognes by the quickest route, D38 and N140, and was the nearest place where he could swim. I was surprised to find the water too low for him to use a diving platform, which we found a few yards upstream by the abbey. For in 1956, both the lot and the Dordogne were flowing too fast for me really to enjoy bathing until July. But then they had been fed by the snowfall of an exceptionally hard winter, and now we were seeing them after a mild one, following a long summer drought. These rivers are not only affected by seasonal changes, but also by the hydroelectric power stations in their upper, in their upper reaches. When the reservoirs behind the dams are full, the sluices are periodically open to release the surplus, and so cause an abrupt increase in the current and volume of flow. It is to this phenomenon that the alarming riverside notices headed Danger de Moor refer. 
But although it would be foolish to camp on one of the islets, which appear only when the river is low or below flood level, which can easily be identified by flood scenes caught on bushes, it is safe to swim unless the current is obviously running too swiftly. But swim upstream, for the banks are steep and slippery, and it is only too easy to drift away from the place where you got into the water and then find it alarmingly difficult to find a firm foothold by which to get out again. The 11th century abbey of Bewley is renowned especially for the tympanum of the south door in which the contrasted environments of heaven and hell are further pointed by a frieze of vengeful and apocalyptic beasts. The town is also the birthplace of Baron de Marbeau whose vivid memoirs describe his rise to lieutenant general in Napoleon's army. But I doubt if many of the inhabitants who daily pass his statue are aware that this remarkable man was the prototype of Conan Doyle's Brigadier Gérard. The statue should be equestrian, for Marbeau's beloved mare, Lisette, was, an outstand was as outstanding as her rider. He bought her for a thousand francs, a fifth of her value, because she suffered from the bad habit of biting like a bulldog and had recently disemboweled her groom with her teeth. For the next five months it took four or five men to settle her and they could only put on her bridle after covering her eyes and fastening all four of her legs. During this period she bit several people, including her owner, and he was thinking of selling her, albeit reluctantly, for she was an incomparable ride when a new groom, a man who was afraid of nothing, before going nearly set, whose, had, whose bad character had been mentioned to him, armed himself with a good hot roast leg of mutton. When the animal flew at him to bite him, he held out the mutton, she sized it in her teeth, and burning her gums, palate and tongue, gave a scream, let the mutton drop, and from that moment was perfectly submissive to him, and did not venture to attack him again. Marbeau then tried the same tactic, where after Lisette became as docile as a dog and allowed me and my servant to approach her freely. But woe to stranger who passed near her. At the Battle of Elau, Lisette richly rewarded her master's faith in her, carrying Napoleon's order of retreat to a hopelessly outnumbered regiment across a plain swarming with Cossacks. Lisette, lighter than a swallow and flying rather than running, devoured the intervening space, leaping the piles of dead men and horses, the ditches, the broken gun carriages, the half-extinguished Biovac fires. Their mission accomplished, Marbeau was returning, carrying the eagle of the regiment, when he was temporarily paralysed by a glancing blow from a cannonball on the nape of his neck, and so unable to defend himself against the bayonet attack by a Russian grenadier. The bayonet, deflected by Mabok's cloak, wounded Lisette in her thigh. Her ferocious instincts being restored by pain, she sprang at the Russian and, at one mouthful, tore off his nose, lips, eyebrows and all the skin of his face, making him a living death's head, dripping with blood. Then, hurling herself with fury among the combatants, kicking and biting, Lisette upset everything she met on the road. The officer who had made so many attempts to strike me tried to hold her by the bridle, she sized him by his belly and carrying him off with ease, she bore him out of the crush to the foot of the hillock, where, having torn out his entrails and mashed his body under her feet, she left him dying in the snow. One is thankful to discover a few pages later that both Marbeau and Desset made a complete recovery and for many more years enjoyed exploits together. It is seldom that a chateau or even inconspicuous ruin, an inconspicuous ruin 
escaped the notice of Michelin's cartographers, but they have overlooked Curamont, as we should have done, but for the kindly advice of the owner of the Mesa garage. Following the D38 eastward through Mesa, then fork right on the D106 to Brasseles, where after a sharp left turn the road winds through meadows until beyond a crest. Curamont and its village suddenly come into view. It seems a scene unchanged since the Middle Ages, for if in fact it was floored, floored by a telegraph pole or patches of corrugated iron, my memory has tactfully deleted them. The outer walls and tower of the castle are virtually intact, although within it is partially ruined and only a portion on the far side is occupied. Until recently it was owned by Coletta's second husband, and although she visited it only briefly, her daughter lived there for many years. I have since been told by friends that Curamonte has a second chateau, a deserted one, which a villager suggested they might like to explore. They did so and found it curiously eerie, for it seemed to have been so abruptly abandoned, with cobwebbed but still sound furniture beyond the unlocked doors and an uncracked dishes on the kitchen shelves. When they asked to whom it belonged, the answer was always an evasive. No one lived there. But I have not been to it. So, for all I know, the owners left only for some mundane reason, such as a sudden craving for an adequate water supply. For the only water comes from two communal wells. I stared down one of them, trying to gauge how much effort it would need to draw up a bucket the dark water was a long way down, for my reflection was no larger than a silver coin. Puremont lies at the source at the northwest corner of the rectangle of by roads on higher ground, and by making this circuit it is seen from vantage points which are most rewarding. Even if in a hurry, at least go south from Puremont to Vergennes, little more than a fine farmhouse and a few cottages turn left at the crossroads on the D144 and pause on the ridge to look back at the little town spread out on its southern slopes like an embroidered apron. The road soon forks and both lead to the D153 at which turn right and at the T road D12 right again to the hamlet of Quezac. One eats well at the Eau saint Bell, in this cool shade of plane trees if the day be hot, and it's comfortable if one sleeps there. Quezac not only provides a magnificent view of the Dordogne, Dordogne Valley, but it is the home of the wine after which the hotel is named. This somewhat resembles Madeira, but is uniquely made from grapes allowed to ripen on the vine until they are about to fall from the stalks and then spread on straw mats, paye, on which they remain until sh under shelter, until pressed during the twelve days of Christmas. From Quezac, the D12 winds down to Betay, which at last is in the Département du Lot. It is from this village that I made my first journey by Michelin, the little tram-like trains which, cooing like amorous pigeons, thread their way across the high plateau and often by tunnel or corniche along the river gorges. Their lines cross and recross the roadway and at night the guardians of their gates are inclined to leave them closed and can be aroused from sleep only by banging on the door <laughs> of the adjacent cartage. When I went to Bataille to inquire at what time I should leave next day so as to reach Paris in time for dinner, the kind woman in charge of the miniature station became so engrossed in the details of this adventurous project that she failed to notice the approach of a train until it had bustled past the station uttering reproachful toots. Her reaction to this incident was so dramatic that I thought she was suffering from a heart attack. The gates were not shut, not shut, she cried in tones of horror that would have been appropriate only had the level crossing been 
strewn with the twitching corpses of passengers and mashed motorists. Feeling guilty that my verbosity had numbed her natural alertness, I administered what comfort I could and eventually discovered that her emotion was caused by the knowledge that the driver of the Michelin, with whom she had a private feud, would undoubtedly sneak about her oversight to the station master at Brief. From the tide D20 crossing the Dordogne leads to a left turning onto the D30 for Saint-Serre, a friendly little town with several good hotels, overlooked by the Tour de saint Laurent, once owned by Eleanor of Aquitaine and now by Jean Lourac, Lourac the well-known designer of modern tapestries. But Eleanor was comparatively recent illustrious inhabitant of Saint-Claire-Certé, Saint-Serre, for the name derives from Estory, daughter of a local landowner, Serenos, who in the 8th century caused it to become a place of pilgrimage. About the year 760, Serenos died, leaving properties whose ownership was disputed by a neighboring seigneur, Elidus. Seeking an amicable settlement, Espire's brother betrothed her to Elius, Elidus, but she, being a Christian and Elidus refusing to join her faith, fled to the forest rather than submit to this expedient marriage. Her brother pursued her, and when she still refused to obey him, he became so incensed that he drew his sword and decapitated her, at which, no whit disturbed, she picked up her head, carried it to a nearby spring. I don't know when this finished, but I finish now.